So I got my undergraduate in biochemistry at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, I then went on to get uh, my PhD in molecular biosciences and bioengineering at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Uh, my specialty there was metabolic engineering of E. coli for biohydrogen production. Um, I went on to do a postdoc uh, where I was working on uh, uh, basically genetic engineering of human adipose stem cells to make them into cardiomyocytes or heart cells uh, to try to repair hearts after uh, heart attacks. Uh, and then I found my way to Mike, uh, who I'd been searching for ever since I was 16. And I read the, uh, the book, The Body Electric by Robert Becker. Uh, and then I have been a postdoc in Mike's lab uh, now for nine years. So I'm no longer a postdoc. I'm a staff scientist at this point. Um, and yeah, I have just been completely fascinated with everything that we do in this lab. We do a lot of very different things, but they all have this, you know, very unifying principle behind them all, which is to understand how systems work, um, how they interact with one another, what uh, makes an individual different from a collective, and how a collective is informed by all of the individual communication. So that communication in our case is bioelectric, uh, but you can take a look at that in you know ant colonies uh, where it's pheromones, mm -hmm. it's visual. Um, so we do work with ants. We do work with uh, computational systems of like swarm behavior. Um, you know, we try to build new novel things out of cells to see how they work as new novel collectives uh, to try to understand how those principles create larger holes and, um, you know, modifying the communication between the individual components um, can give rise to completely different morphologies, uh, regardless of what the native genetic code is. And I think that that's what's really fascinating is that um, we can build animals with completely different structures than their you know, native code uh, says they should be built with. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can do that just by changing the way the cells are communicating with one another. Um, so no genetic modification, just, just by changing how the gap junctions are communicating. Right. Um, and what the bioelectrics are doing, uh, which is what sets the communication between the, the cells. So that's that's a really helpful introduction. And I think before I get into any of the specifics, I would be interested to learn about how recent is the sort of rise in biology of looking at the interconnections and the, the learning within an organism outside of DNA and in caring about how the whole organism functions based based on its structure rather than just looking at specific parts so i'm wondering on sort of yeah would you be able to contextualize for us or the um the history and 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 um how we've started working on these kind of issues yeah uh so you know i can give you the the history of bioelectricity which is is pretty interesting sure, um sure. and in that case so uh galvani was really the 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 kind of center of um, the bioelectric movement. It was it was called the vitalist movement um, way back when. You know, this is before the discovery of acetylcholae. Uh, this is at the time of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And actually the work that they were doing was what inspired her book. Um, it was mm -hmm. they were they were messing around with frog limbs. They found that if they applied a voltage to a frog limb, it would twitch. Um, and so there was this whole idea that there was this electrical vital force, and that's what the vitalist movement, that's why they called themselves that. Mm. Um, but the vitalist movement and, and all the experimentation with electricity and tissues and animals, it kind of went to the wayside as soon as uh, acetylcholae was discovered. And once acetylcholae, uh, which is, you know, kind of the reason why the nerves and things twitch, it's the biochemical part of it um 
once that that was discovered, everything went to a biochemistry perspective. Mm. So this whole interaction that they saw with electricity and all that was kind of set aside for this brand new revolution Mm. in biochemistry. And so everybody just started going after the biochemistry and then the genes and, you know, proteins. Mm. And so it all became about the little parts, but not you know, the magical, mystical electricity that had originally uh, been what kind of fascinated people. And I think what's happening now is that we have a very good grip on the biochemistry and all of the genetic networks and pathways. Um, But there's a lot of things that that cannot explain. Mm -hmm. And so um, collective behavior is one of them. And a lot of that is like, you know, where, where are these emergent properties coming from? Why is it that these collective behaviors give rise to completely different structures, completely different properties of tissue? And so that has really been uh, what Mike's lab is focusing on is how communication between cells is what really sets morphology and that that communication can even trump the the genetic blueprint of the organism um Mm. and that's really powerful because if you are coming at it completely from a reductionistic viewpoint then there's only one way that you could you know let's say create a second heart in an organism you would have to build it piece by piece with every genetic you know component of how a heart is built uh you know in the womb And that's not what we do. What we do is we just change the bioelectric signature of the cells that are already there. And then voila, a heart forms Uh completely. And that was just a nudge in a direction because of the bioelectric signature. So what that does is it changes the communication between the cells in that area. And it changes it so much so that they turn on and off different transcriptional pathways and then you get completely different structures being built. So mm-hmm. we can build second hearts, can elongate brains. Uh, we can build uh, fins, extra limbs. Uh, we can even get an eye formation on the tail of a tadpole, which you can't do uh, through genetic means. Right. So all of these are just because we're setting a different kind of communication channel uh in that area yeah and so it seems then kind of to me that this bioelectricity is perhaps like as important as the chemical and the 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 structural um but and so it's kind of um interesting that it hasn't then been explored and then a, a strange question is then what even what is bioelectricity and how does it work and a strange question because maybe we should know it if it's so important but but yeah so um most people are familiar with bioelectricity through neurons, right? Mm-hmm. So you know that neurons fire, right? So that's bioelectricity, that firing, right? So it's called an action potential. And the same thing is true with cardiomyocytes or uh, with muscles. You know that you know when you contract a muscle, there's some electrical stuff going on there, right? Um, so the thing that most people don't understand, though, is that those are all just specialized versions Mm. of every single cell in your body. So every single cell in your body is communicating with it, with other cells electrically. And what do I mean by electrically? Well, I mean by transfer of ions. So every cell has a certain amount of ions on the inside and a certain amount of ions on the outside. Now, most cells have more negative ions on the inside, uh, and so they're mostly negative. There are varying degrees of negativity, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the cell, when it first starts out, when it's a stem cell, it actually doesn't have as many negative ions in it. So it's what we call depolarized, meaning that it has less negative ions in it than a than an older cell and an older cell and I, I like to explain it to people like this like when you're young you're very like you're very positive you have a very kind of like hopeful view about life and then as you get older and you get maybe a little bit more jaded with life then maybe you get a little bit more negative so then that way that kind of reminds me okay young cells less negative 
Right. Older cells, more negative. So on on the scale of things, uh, we, we have a scale of millivolts. So uh, embryonic stem cells are around like eh, negative five millivolts. And a differentiated neuron muscle cell is around negative 80 millivolts. Oh. So it's very negative. And that's what we call hyperpolarized. So it's it's very different from the outside of the cell. So it's hyperpolarized. And depolarized means it's not as different from the outside of the cell. So that's kind of an important thing that you need to understand about bioelectricity is mm. that and that each cell in your body has a different bioelectric resting membrane potential. So the more negative that they are, the less regenerative they are. That's why neurons don't regenerate very well. Uh -huh. um, and the kind of if they're in the middle, which is really interesting, like the liver is the most regenerative organ. Right. Mm -hmm. And the the liver is at about negative 30 millivolts. So it kind of is in this middle range where it still has the plasticity. It has the ability to divide like the stem cells, mm -hmm. but it still has some identity like the like the older cells. Right. It's kind of like in its uh, like teenage years, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so what we look at is, OK, let's look at cancer now. Well, cancer is very depolarized. It almost looks like those embryonic stem cells. Mm. So one of the things that I work on is trying to figure out a way to hyperpolarize cancer cells to get them to the point where they're jaded old people and can't divide anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult to do. It seems that cancer has a lot of things built into it to try to keep it at that depolarized state because it has to be depolarized in order for it to divide. If you are not uh, depolarized enough, then you cannot form that mitotic spindle and you can't actually divide very well. So that's what we're working on is trying to come up with different ways of like pushing them into this different uh, bioelectric state. I see. Well, there was a couple of things that I wanted to to go into in bioelectrics, but why don't we go down that route route since you mentioned it? Mm -hmm. But first, I wanted to ask. I've actually been discussing with my my friend to try and understand it. What what is cancer? First of all, to to sort of embed this in in bioelectrics. Yeah. So you know, I, I this is this is very interesting. Is how does it arise? Right. Mm -hmm. And what we know so far is that it seems to arise out of high stress areas. So let's say you got a really bad injury, um, you know, on your arm or something like when you were 20. As, as you get older, the injuries really matter more. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it healed. Right. But those areas of your of your of your body, those cells were a lot more stressed out when that happened. Mm -hmm. And when cells stress out, they produce what's called reactive oxygen species into, into the extracellular milieu. And those reactive oxygen species can have an impact on mitochondria and the bioenergetics of the cells. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that it seems like the mitochondria are somewhat damaged in cancer. It's like they're mito the mitochondria, which are uh, if, if you all remember your high school biology, uh, is the powerhouse of the huh. cell, right? It's kind of like this symbiotic bacteria that powers everything inside of our cells. Um, and so it's producing all the energy for the cell. It's producing the ATP. It's producing all of the metabolites necessary, uh, you know, for the metabolism of the cell. So once that starts going bad, then the whole bioenergetic landscape of the cell gets completely changed. It goes through what's called oxidative glycolysis. And so it starts breaking down glucose, uh, even when there's oxygen present, and it's not using um, the uh, reduction, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. So if you remember all your little pathways <laughs> from biology, no. um, there's different ways that mitochondria can make energy. And uh, one of them doesn't require oxygen. Mm -hmm. So that's glycolysis. Uh, and then there's oxidative phosphorylation. And that's the one that has all the kind of NADH and FAD and all those things. And it produces a lot more ATP, right? right. So it seems like uh, what's happening is that they're, they're 
metabolic uh, baseline is getting screwed up from that initial stress. Mm -hmm. And then once that happens, then they uh, start to have some genetic instability. Mm -hmm. And the genetic instability then ends up where the chromosomes are no longer pulling apart exactly the the way they should. Mm -hmm. You get splits and splices between different chromosomes and abnormalities. And then once you get to that point, then all sorts of other problems start to occur. But the basic premise of that cancer cell, it cannot function as a, uh, you know, depolarized, constantly replicating cell unless it has that change in its bioenergetics first. It has to have that change in bioenergetics. Right. Now, the way that oncogenes work, there are some oncogenes, which, you know, some people have genetic mutations that they just are born with. So that gives them a propensity to developing cancer. And a lot of the times what that is, is that their genes themselves are messed up at the very beginning, or they had a chemical insult that screwed up their mm-hmm. genes. And then what once that happens, they have to have a combination of that, along with the stress that flips on that bioenergetic switch to that state of becoming cancerous. And so when by, with bioenergetic, you mean like that, say, for example, an injury, like a, an initial stress? And then, yeah, the, 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 the change in the mitochondria, the, the, whatever causes that change, if it's stress from a, uh, a, a bad gene or it's stress from an injury or it's stress from a chemical, whatever it's being stressed by, the mitochondria responds by switching its whole program so that it's now doing this uh, oxidative glycolysis. It's, it's changing the way that it processes uh, its food basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when that, when, when that change occurs, when that switch occurs, that depolarizes the cancer and that's what allows the cancer to keep replicating without checks. I see. One final question on understanding cancer it seems that when DNA changes, like it starts replicating, but then it's, you know, like mutations or it changes in the way it replicates. Do some changes not lead to cancer, but then others do? And then the ones that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's the ones that, the ones that survive are the ones that replicate, right? right. So there's a lot of cells that have damage from whatever, you know, and, and mm. they, they go through, uh, you know, apoptosis they they go through a programmed cell death Mm. and it's only the ones that you know have this bioenergetic switch um along with the genetic propensity to be able to continuously divide and Mm. and avoid that apoptotic you know checkpoint right Mm. it's like these cell cycle checkpoints those are the ones that become cancer right but you don't even get to that point unless you've got that insult in the very beginning right i see in your work it says that you work on like the micro environment around cancers and would you like to talk a bit about about that and what work you've been doing sort of understanding cancer and like helping resolve it yeah so um it's really interesting one of the reasons why your immune system doesn't just go after cancer and kill it is because the cancer is protected by these what are called cancer associated fibroblasts now they're not cancerous themselves they're just fibroblasts if you don't remember uh, from biology fibroblasts are kind of like all over the place like all your body has fibroblasts every organ that you have basically has some fibroblasts around it that are working with it right so there's fibroblasts you know from your colon there's fibroblasts in your you know intestinal lining there's fibroblasts all over the place right Mm -hmm. they're kind of the support cells they're the ones that kind of create the uh ecm that surrounds like the different tissues uh they're the ones that really um kind of support all of the like epithelial cells and and the other cells that are kind of interacting with the environment um so in cancer what happens is that the fibroblasts that are surrounding the cancer cells they get reprogrammed they get reprogrammed to this cancer associated fibroblast state and what that means is that they start throwing out all of these stress signals right And when they do that, um, those stress signals actually kind of 
I guess, provide a camouflage mm. for the cancer. So when when uh, when a immune cell now comes into this area, because of all the stuff that the cancer associated fibroblasts are throwing out, mm. the that immune cell can't activate. It can't turn on when it gets into that area. I see. And, and, and so then, you know, basically the cancer goes into stealth mode. The other thing that happens is those cancer associated fibroblasts start creating a different ECM. So they start making an ECM, an extracellular matrix, basically a scaffolding around the tumor. And it makes it so that the uh, cancer can actually travel out of the tumor and into the other areas. So it actually helps with metastases. So okay. it they they basically enable the cancer cells to start moving to other areas. Okay. Oh, so, so that makes a lot of sense that the environment is really influ influential then. I guess the genetic changes in cancer for the cells that survive, sometimes like th these things can happen. So then what kind of changes to the environment can can one do to say, do the opposite and, and, and do bioelectrics come in yeah. helping resolve this? So what I'm working on right now is not only changing the bioelectrics of the cancer cells and trying to get them to not replicate as much, but I'm mm -hmm. also trying to look at what happens when we change the bioelectrics of the non-cancerous cells. Mm -hmm. Can we make it so that those cancer, those fibroblasts that become cancer associated fibroblasts, can we stop that process? Can mm -hmm. we make it so they no longer give out those signals of what cancer associated fibroblasts give out. And mm -hmm. that would be huge, right? Because then you would be able to basically remove that stealth blanket off of the tumor and, the, and then your immune system can actually find these tumor cells and you would stop that ability of the cancer cells to use that extracellular matrix that those fibroblasts are producing to escape their area and metastasize and become more mobile into other areas. I see. I see. Um, with bioelectrics, you talked here about cancer and you also discussed a little bit at the start, but what other kinds of importance does it have and what ways can we, we change it, say, for medical interventions? Yeah. So um, what's really interesting is there's already a bunch of drugs that have been FDA approved that are ion channel inhibitors and activators and they're used for different things. Right. So um, like Rogaine, there's a good one. Uh, that one is a I, I believe it's a potassium an, an ATP uh, potassium channel uh, that is opened up by Rogaine. Uh -huh. And so. Um, you know, that that right there, that's a perfect example. You can use that drug and see if you can repurpose it for cancer. Um, or uh, I when I, I worked on glioblastoma and we screened like 40 something different compounds and combinations of all of these, you know, um, ion channel modulators uh, that were already FDA approved. And one of them uh, that we found, let's see. Let me look up and I can tell you a little bit more. One of them no was pant pantoprazole. Uh, and pantoprazole is uh, something that you use for um, high acid production in your stomach. So if you have ulcers, um, it's basically what you take for that. Um, and that in combination with uh, another drug called ritigabine uh, really helped like just stop cancer proliferation. Uh, mm. It was it was amazing. And then when we removed it, when we removed the um, the treatment, we actually saw that the cancer cells no longer divided. So they were so inhibited by that combination that they went down a lineage that, uh, according to our stains, looked like they had differentiated. They were no longer cancer cells. They were these giant differentiated cells uh, that had what we call senesced and a uh -huh. senescence. I don't know if you've heard this lately, yeah, but they, they yep. call them zombie cells basically. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're like these giant cells that they have all sorts of problems inside of them. They're not getting cleared out yet. So they haven't like uh, what they call uh, gone through the apoptotic cascade. They haven't 
like created their their whole suicide program yet mm -hmm. um but they have stopped dividing so they're no longer dividing now there are some senescent cells that can start dividing again but these senescent cells did not and that's really important um then the other thing is you know you can combine this type of a treatment for cancer with what's called senolytics and senolytics are chemicals that find senescent cells and kill them right so it's basically uh like a you can have a molecular tag or you can have antibody therapy that finds these senescent cells and basically puts a target on them for your immune system to clear them out so with senescent cells are they better than cancer or um yeah i mean because they're not dividing right, right? Okay. uh but they they can cause problems in the in and of themselves because senescent cells most of the time it's called uh, uh sasp which is uh mm -hmm. senescent associated signaling proteins or something like that um basically it's like all of the all of the growth factors all of the cytokines uh that the senescent cells kind of throw out into their area mm -hmm. those can also cause issues right those can uh cause problems with inflammation uh they can uh create cancer in some instances right um so as we get older we have a, a large buildup of senescent cells in our body and it's actually uh one of the key contributors to the aging process is that they start throwing out a lot of inflammatory markers and so then that's why you know your joints right. start creaking and aching and you just don't feel as energetic i see you said you you wanted to bring up like a a particular drug um yeah, so it was ritigabine. And ritigabine uh, is an anti-epileptic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it, it was approved for epilepsy. And a, a lot of the drugs that I tried initially were anti-epileptics, right? Because we mm -hmm. knew that they worked on the neurons. Um, and for glioblastoma, we knew that they got through the blood-brain barrier, right? So we wanted to be able to get those drugs to the brain as well. I see. When bioelectrics, when you're influencing bioelectrics with the drugs, is it always changing sort of the ion amounts or concentrations in cells is that what we mean by bioelectrics yes so okay. what 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 these drugs do is they either block or they open ion channels that then change that balance of the uh, negative ions in and outside of the cell and so that's what we're trying to do now you know that sounds like oh it's pretty straightforward right like you know we can just block this potassium channel and you know we will depolarize the cell it won't it, it won't hyperpolarize hyperpolarizing for potassium we have a lot uh we have a lot less potassium on the outside of the cell than we do on the inside so the potassium wants to go out of the cell because mm. of a concentration gradient, right? And so the potassium channels are kind of the gatekeepers of that. So if they're open, they allow that potassium to go out. Mm -hmm. And so you get a hyperpolarization of the cell when you do that um, because you have a, a lot less of those positive potassium ions inside uh -huh. of the cell, right? Um, however, of course, <laughs> biology is not that you know, clear cut. So let's say um, you depolarize your cell. Well, one of the things that happens when you depolarize your cell is a bunch of calcium comes rushing in from that depolarization. And then as a compensation for that calcium coming in, there's a huge, large conductance potassium channel that opens up and then you get a hyperpolarization. So sometimes drugs that you think depolarize a cell actually hyperpolarize the cell because of the, compens the compensatory mechanism that's in there, right? Because okay. you can't just turn one knob, <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like a, a spider web. As soon as you step on one part, the whole other part down here starts moving, you know? Right. And so you really have to come up with strategies. I think co combinatorial strategies are really the way to go right where you hit one channel and then you hit the compensa compensatory channel that gets activated by that you know but at some point you know that's kind of like uh sticking your fingers in a dam that's starting to leak right because uh -huh. you put your finger in one and then you got to put your finger in another and then you know it, that's exactly how biology works and that's what's so beautiful about biology is that it has 
all these compensatory mechanisms, right? And because mm-hmm. it wants to stay in its steady state. So you have to figure out a way to tweak that. And, you know, that's the challenge. When you talk there about like drugs that can influence bioelectrics, is it is kind of the only way to say have treatments like having say combinations of drugs? Are there ways to influence bioelectrics without them? Like I know there's work, I forgot what it's called, that kind of worm that uh, Michael, Michael Evan likes, not a worm. Um, Planaria? Yeah, a yeah. Uh, it is, it's a flatworm, yeah. Okay, okay, it is. Um, yeah, so so are there other ways to influence bioelectrics? Yeah, so the other way is by uh, changing gap junctions. Okay. So gap junctions are basically the way that the two cells are coupled. So if you think of it as a circuit, right, then that's like the wire that's running between those two. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, so the 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 gap junctions are kind of like your resistors. Right. For your flow of electricity. So if you don't have a lot of gap junctions, then you don't have a lot of flow from one cell to the other. Um, your resistance is high. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have a lot of gap junctions then you get a lot more flow between the two. Right. Um, And then the gap junctions, of course, (laughs) they're not that simple either. Um, They're gating. So like whether or not they're open or closed really depends on the voltage of each individual player. So if you have two cells, one's hyperpolarized and one's depolarized, maybe that gap junction is now closed because that differential between the two is so high that it doesn't it, it doesn't. So now if you have two depolarized cells now, that thing opens up. Right. Because. Uh, because of the voltage changes between the two. So the gap junctions themselves are not like this very easy, okay, yeah, you know, it's just always letting things flow. They're influenced by pH. They're influenced by reactive oxygen species. They're influenced by other things that can bind to them. You know, so all of the communication channels are also very well entangled with other other proteins, other things. I see. Yeah. I think um, one interesting place to go from here would be um, like non-neuronal cells and how memory and how they learn, like maybe in like on, on, in broad brush, what kinds of ways of, of learning and like changing their structure and solving sort of problems do non-neuronal cells have that we may have not appreciated? Yeah, so um, you can look at paramecium. I'm sure that you have seen paramecium before, like in videos, right? They're those little weird things with like all the cilia and like they have like weird protrusions that reach out and grab things. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it looks like this weird alien world and pond water, right? Mm -hmm. Well, all of those don't have neurons. Those are all non-neuronal cells and they are all working at a coordinated goal. You know, Um, if you take a look at a slime mold, uh, you know, slime molds, uh, if if you watched uh, what was it? The 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 movie that just came out on HBO. Was it The Last of Us or something? It's like all about the uh, the fungus infestation. But the, the opening credits, they you know we we all got very upset <laughs> because it's not a fungus it's a slime mold oh, how dare they? Um, <laughs> but yes like that whole opening credit where you have this thing kind of crawling all over the place um that's a slime mold um it's called physarum and we work a lot with physarum uh in this lab uh because it is also kind of a weird collective it has like this huge body and all these very like all of these individual nuclei that don't have cell separations between them, right? Um, There are no neurons in this thing, but it can learn. And so one of the things that we saw was, or well, there, there's been different experiments that we've done. I think one of the ones that I actually found in, in the literature uh, for training was uh, somebody, a group had one of these physarum, and they would give these cold pulses in like timed pulses. So there was an exact time between the cold pulses, right? Mm-hmm. And when the cold pulses happen, Physarum would slow down because it can't go as fast towards towards its food source, right? Mm-hmm. And so what was interesting was that when you didn't give the pulse after, you know, this repetitive pulse giving, when you when you stopped giving the pulse it behaved as if the pulse was still being given. 
Mm. Right. So um, it it had basically figured out that there was a pulse coming. Get ready for the pulse and kind of anticipated that the Mm. pulse was going to be given. Now, if you don't give it the pulse the next time, then it slows down, but not as much as it slowed down the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you don't give the pulse the next time. Now it doesn't slow down at all. Right. But then when you give the pulse again, it slows down a lot faster than if you had initially given it the pulse without ever giving it a pulse before. Right. So it's it's become habituated to the pulse. Right. right? So now it's it, it has it has kind of changed its its way of of responding to your environmental stimuli so that right there or sorry not habituated but sensitized because it it reacted faster to the pulse the next time right um and so there's all of those different things are are true in these uh you know non-neuronal systems but you know what's really cool so there's this uh indian researcher his name was uh uh jandra bose um bose uh speakers are actually named after him uh he's very like a lot of people don't know about him and he was an absolute genius like right up there with tesla um and bose he, he basically invented uh the radio uh and he did a lot of experiments with non living and living matter and he wanted to see how they reacted to stimuli so he actually would take a, a piece of like muscle fiber and put it between these two um, two points, like kind of like, you know, stretched it. And then he would hit the muscle fiber on one end and read an electrical output on the other end. And he found that same sort of thing, right? If you keep hitting it, huh. eventually like it will not respond as much the next time. But if you, uh, you know, wait and you kind of let it exhaust out and then you hit it again, it has a higher response than it did Uh in the first time, right? But then he's like, okay, well, is this true for plants? So he did the same thing with plants, like a a root fiber, I think is what he used. Uh, And he saw the same thing with plants. And then he said, well, what about metals? And sure enough, certain metals, as long as they are in a crystalline lattice, so if you have a pure wire of silver or a pure wire of copper, it had the same exact properties. But if whatever metal you had was a mix that's no longer in a nice ordered lattice, then you don't get those properties. So it may be that this learning you know, is at a molecular level where you have these crystalline lattices and, you know, it, it's it's a property of how the electrons, you know, are traveling through those lattices. And all living mm-hmm. things are also liquid crystals. We all have very organized, uh, you know, crystalline lattices inside of us. All of our, all of our proteins, all of the ECM, all of that. Uh-huh. So I think... Um... Richard Watson, Chris Fields, and Michael Evan had a really interesting discussion on this. So I'll link that in the description. And like that makes me want to ask, like, in what ways do findings like that, where we have this kind of we can have like habituation, sensitization, or these at least changes in the molecular, yeah, and and then you know, cellular and down to molecular level, how does it change the way we think about memory, the way we think about the way like cells learn? Or even just like how we understand the complex things that happen in biology. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it it opens up a lot more uh, a lot more pathways, right? So uh, Mike and I just published a paper where we discussed that uh, the memory of the larger systems can be tapped into for treating things like addiction or. Um, Uh, coming up with new ways of uh, kind of uh, getting rid of of bad habits, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or even cancer therapies, uh, immunotherapies, because what we found was there's, there's a whole bunch of papers on like Pavlovian conditioning, right? 
And there was this guy, and boy, uh, <laughs> some of the stuff he did was uh, pretty hardcore. But basically, he found that he could condition uh, a lot of different organs in the body. So he could condition bile uh, from, you know, the gallbladder, like the excretion of bile. He could condition uh, changes in body temperature. He could condition, uh, you know, uh, surges in, in adrenaline and stress responses. And basically you, uh, and I think bladder was another one that you could condition. Um, but he, he found that as long as the organ is in like a direct contact with the central nervous system, and the central nervous system can influence the, the, the organ function, that you can condition it. And there was some more uh, experiments that showed that you could even condition the immune system. And so that's amazing because what that means is that, you know, instead of giving somebody chemotherapy or immunotherapy uh, in the same room at the same time of every week with the same doctor, the better thing would be to switch it up. Because your body is uh -huh. already con creating a compensation for the effect because it wants to be in steady state, right? It right. wants to be in whatever state it's at. It doesn't want to be perturbed. So if it knows that something's coming, you, it gets all of the cues that, okay, now, now this thing's going to occur in our body. So we're going to turn on all the compensation mechanisms for it right now so that we're, we're ahead of the curve, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't do that, if you switch it up, you put them in a different room, it, you can even just change the temperature of the room and the conditioning becomes uncoupled. So there's all these different things that you can do. You can change like the sound, you can change the person, you can change the room that you're doing it, the time that you're doing it. And all of that will get rid of that compensation that your body's already creating. So we can, we can leverage what we know about this conditioning that's happening in the entire system uh, and, and put these kind of environmental controls to stop that from occurring. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Like, and, and it makes me think that, yeah, we can kind of like, you know, fight cancer in like a similar way to how we like go to the gym or we need to switch training up to, get stronger in different domains so i mean that um one question i had there was so it's interesting that to say most appropriately fight cancer we need to actually look at like the broader more comp the complex system to be like oh we'll actually look at these these compensatory mechanisms but then you've also been talking about about how actually we can go even further down into like the fine grains of a cell and its own habituation and things and that makes me want to ask in what way should we understand biology? Like, should we look at the small level, the high level? It's interesting that in, in, in what you've been saying, like, there are these interesting interactions between the small and large scale. And I wonder, like, more broadly, how does that go? You have to toggle. You have to constantly mm. be toggling between the two. You know, right. like when you find when you when you're looking at these things that are very reductionistic, you can say, hey, what is what is the analog at a higher level of complexity? Right. Mm -hmm. And it might give you some insight into how that smaller thing works at the lower level of complexity. Right. So it, it's you know, you can you can kind of look around your society and your world, you know, or you can look at economics even, mm -hmm. you know, and you can kind of get an idea of how systems work. And because the systems have like this same kind of physics behind them at all, like all levels of complexity. Right. And th that doesn't go away. So, you know, always keep in mind that larger picture. Always, always look at whatever you're looking at when you're looking at the small scale. You know, try to compare it to the large scale. See, where does that fit in on the large scale? What's what's its analog on the larger scale? What does it do? What, what does its analog do on that larger scale? Right. Uh -huh. And like I think, you know, the analog for for uh, bioelectricity uh is you know communication at an r level right mm -hmm. how we talk to one another the electrical you know world that we live in right the internet you know your phone mm -hmm. all of that how how that is keeping us together how that's changing our societies how that molds what you become you know mm -hmm. interesting yeah so because in, in that sense you can't actually just look at like any individual level in their biology you need to like look at like very 
precise you know communications that you know between people that changes sort of everything and and okay I mean do you have any other thoughts about extending your work or like biological thinking in general to like cultural level like like I could maybe even like distributed cognition between individuals um like the ways in which sort of us like I mean I've been watching some lectures on even like ant colonies and stuff and I know we don't work necessarily necessarily in that in that way there but yeah they're a bit like a super organism I was wondering if you have thoughts on that in general this topic yeah yeah I mean I think uh so one of the things that happens with cancer cells is they seem to lose communication with the other cells or that communication changes a lot Mm -hmm. right so there has been a lot of papers that have shown that the connections uh the gap junctions basically uh between normal cells are very different than the gap junctions between cancer cells that they've shut off communication um you know or 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 change that communication right so that it's no longer the same type of communication and then that allows really cancer kind of escape and do its own thing so some people have tried to you know reintroduce those gap junctions and they actually can see that you know the the tumor doesn't proliferate as much when they reintroduce those gap junctions right mm. um so the question is is you know have we through our amazing ability to uh manipulate our environment right like air conditioning houses right all of that have we basically uh removed that communication with our environment have Mm -hmm. we now we're no longer getting the signals from our environment right so does that make us cancerous in some respect you know i mean i Uh think that you know human beings have kind of removed themselves from the larger tissue right we we are, are look at ourselves as being separate from nature we don't even look at ourselves as being animals you know i my my 4 year old is telling her that we're we're an animal she says, no we're not animals you know because yeah. the whole way that you know animals are introduced as a concept from when we're very small is that they are not us right and it, and it's the same thing with nature, you know, it, it's, oh, it's pretty to look at. Sure, we'll go hiking in it. But this, you know, deep seated connection to understanding its uh, its rhythms, being part of its rhythms, we no longer have to be part of its rhythms, right, mm-hmm. in order to survive. All we need is air conditioning and a good house that we've built. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of parallels in our yeah, society. Yeah, that's, yeah. That. That's very interesting because you you say you mentioned like uh, AC and air air conditioning. It it, it makes me interested because, again, I also noticed like having too many comforts. You you realize you can deal with a lot more if you actually say for some reason like hiked all day or went to the sauna and cold and you realize your body can deal with it. So you're like, what more could my body do? And, and, And then, well, one question I kind of had was like, again, on, on, on collective intelligences, like, example mushrooms um they have like my my mycelian like you know links between them and like it seems that plants and other animals like communicate and have more kind of these sort of symbiotic relationships like do do humans have more more of these and like we kind of think or are we more like more integrated to the in ecosystems than we sort of imagine oh absolutely yeah our whole microbiome is uh, a symbiotic system you know mm, like right. we are a coral reef we're not an individual. There's more bacterial cells in our body than there are our own cells. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that bacteria that's in our guts, that's determining our health. That's determining our moods. That's determining our immune systems. Uh, all of that is happening from the bacteria that are inside of us. So the foods that we eat and the things that we do to nurture or to kill that bacteria, that's going to have a huge effect on on ourselves. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're not as aware of that. Uh, our pets, our dogs, you know, I mean, dogs are this crazy symbiotic organism that we've, you know, selected to like be able to pick up on our, our facial cues, our emotions, all the things that we've we've done there. So I think we have the capacity to do it. And I think a lot of it, uh, you know, to, to be able to create these connections, I think we need to have some way of making those connections more apparent to our modern way of thinking. And I think a lot of that comes from biofeedback 
I'm a huge believer in biofeedback. Um, so I, I was part of uh, this, this UH, University of Hawaii Sustainability Program. And, you know, because I was doing the, the biofuels while I was there. Uh, and one of the things that we did that was just amazing was putting out biofeedback to all of to to this to to these people that were in this building right and so in this building we told people okay you're using this much energy on this floor 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 four used this much energy this last week floor three used this much energy floor two used this much energy and just by having something that they could see Mm. that that's how much energy they were using they tried to lower how much energy they were using right mm -hmm. so so if you have these biofeedback mechanisms you can kind of create that link again with your environment but mm -hmm. the problem is is that that link that we normally had you know because you know boy we're really cold right now right or you know wow we're really hot right now whatever environment it is that has been now kind of uh outsourced to the uh -huh. ac controller right and only the ac controller knows how many times it had to turn on and then regulate the temperature mm -hmm. right so if you can somehow uh show the person what the ac controller has been doing now it's visual you know feedback of what's actually being being done right mm -hmm. So I think that you know we can do that. We can we can kind of create uh, uh, you know meters that we can look at and we can say, okay, I want to try to do better next week. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question. You talked about our own like our own multicellular organism being sort of a kind of collective. I was kind of wondering. We talked about senescence earlier. I was wondering why cells are kind of like kind of agree to like kill themselves and like die and like or even mitochondria why do they agree to like well yeah well before there used to be bacteria in some somewhere i understand it um mm -hmm. so so what are kind of the mechanisms that allow our cells to sort of function as a unitary sort of being like how why do they all work together yeah yeah basically well because they all evolve together right they are they everything evolved together in this kind of crazy soup it's like nothing evolved in isolation you know isolation only exists in our minds because it's conceptual you know and no, there is no isolation there's no boundaries you know <laughs> like right. all of that is all of that is uh concepts that we've created the reality is that you know, there's a huge microbiome on the outside of you. You know, I mean, every time you touch something, you're interacting with the other living things around you. Stuff's in the air. You mm -hmm. know, your body's constantly like interacting with all of these different things in this soup that, you know, is mm -hmm. is our environment. Um, so everything's evolving together. Everything's, you know, utilizing uh, the components that it's next to and and trying to optimize that. But this that's so thanks for that and this kind of makes you want to ask like sometimes we think that dna is like the only way in which like okay we all have the same dna and, and say in our one our own organism that's how we kind of can all cooperate together all ourselves but in what ways say the bioelectrics or other mechanisms um you know like symbiotic relationships even between organisms like how, how, how what kind of ways should we go beyond dna and thinking about these kind of relationships well, I think, um, you know, you have to look at like, what, what are they transferring between one another? Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's, you know, just in DNA and in itself, there's a lot of transfer of DNA that people aren't even aware of. Like, you know, do you know that when you eat rice, that there's pieces of its genetic material that get into your bloodstream? and change your own genetic material that changes the way that your body reacts and and and, and makes different proteins wow. i mean a lot of people don't even know that you know mm -hmm. um there's what's called horizontal gene transfer that occurs a lot uh, between different organisms so you can have like a bacteria that picks up 
uh, some genes from, uh, you know, a different organism that it's, it's next to like a fungus, you know, or that fungus picks up some of those bacterial genes, you know, and it's because there's this transfer of DNA between them, you know, and uh, it, it, there's, there's this constant genetic fluidity that's happening. I mean, our, our, our genome has a ton of viral sequences in it, a ton. They're like all over our genome. And that's because of all the infections that we have had. Our, our body takes in a piece of those infections and integrates it into our DNA because then that makes us more resilient against those infections later on, right? Uh -huh. So we're like this amalgamation of all that. Now, mitochondria has actually uh, transferred a lot of its genes that it needs to build itself, has transferred it into our genome. It has its own genome. But it off it, it it basically offloaded a lot of its genome into our genome, uh -huh. you know. So I mean, there's like this crazy fluidity, but uh, there's also the fluidity of like the microbiome. The all of the bacteria are producing metabolites, so they're producing things like butyrate, short chain fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, bile salts, all sorts of different stuff, and all of those things are what helps our immune system we need them as cofactors we you know our bodies depend on them in order to have optimal health is things that our bacteria are producing you know uh -huh. so the metabolites their waste products basically bacteria poop you know our bodies have become dependent on it um, our bodies are also dependent on the fact that that bacteria can break down these larger structures so that our cells can then take in the smaller structures that that result from that breakdown mm -hmm. right so it's you know it, it's 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 sound it's light it's chemistry it's you know all of this is the way that all of this is communicating and and creating mm -hmm. this like symbiotic thing yeah interesting and so here's a question and i know it's kind of an annoying one in biology so but i want but you know i wonder if your work on like collective intelligences and bioelectrics and, and the things you talked about here like what how does it change how we define life or what what can we think of as like the definition of of life given this <laughs> <concept> <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, again, you know, you fall into this trap of semantics, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a word and we create a definition for it. Like, and mm -hmm. all of that is false, right? Cause that's not the reality. The reality is there are no like lines. There are no, there are no hard lines between anything, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you look at a virus, right? Everybody's freaking out. Like here it is. It's a self-replicating thing. You know, it can't mm -hmm. do it without a host, but, you know, we can also not self-replicate if we don't eat, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who's dependent on what, right? right. <laughs> like, it's the same sort of thing. Like, we have to have the basic building blocks to create another copy of ourselves. We can't just do that in, a, in an isolated box, you know. Same thing with the, the virus. It just happens to eat host bodies, you know. It happens to use what the host's machinery is to create that that uh copy of itself and then there's crystals you know crystals are self-replicating structures as well you know right. they 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 do it a lot slower you know and like i think a lot of it too is uh the time time really screws up our perceptions of things right so we don't think of plants as being mobile things we think of them as just being kind of static but watch a time lapse of some plants sometime and you realize they are not static beings. They're moving around all the time. They're adjusting their leaves to get the right sun. You know, they're, they, when they're young, uh, young saplings, they actually, what they call play, right? They like move around in areas that it, not, it, it's not, okay. uh, it's not advantageous for the plant to get more sunlight. They actually just move around in all sorts of different ways, you know? Uh -huh. So I think uh, a lot of our ideas of what the, the defining lines are between mm -hmm. categories, a lot of that comes from our time perception as well, right? Uh -huh. So if, if you look at geological time and you speed that up, I mean, the formation of all of the different geology that's out there looks like the formation of different tissues 
I mean, it's 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 beautiful compression, sedimentary rocks, like all of that. But we don't see that. We just see these lifeless things. And they're not. There's a dynamic and they're growing and they're changing and they're, you know, replicating just like, you know, our cells and and the animals are as well. It's just at a different time scale. And I think the same is true for the universe as a whole. I think it's probably doing the same thing, but at a very different time scale, which is kind of beautiful because we can actually see that time scale through through, uh, you know, astronomy, because we can right. look back in time and we can, you know, we can kind of trace that evolution and how it changes and we can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you like looked into like working complexity science or like there's a book the romance of reality which recently came out kind of like arguing like from the second law of thermodynamics that the world gets more complex because i'm just interested in like why if, if there were no like you know organisms like us why there seems to be more and more cooperative collectives and like like you get more and more cells and different kinds of organisms like working together um again it's not really I'll, yeah i don't know if you have any no, it's, yeah I've, I've definitely thought about that um the the thing that i see is that as matter cools it starts to uh create structures starts to to interact with one another and that is because it's energetically favorable right the the bond structures are energetically favorable than the than the loose versions of them mm -hmm. so but you have to have a cooling environment for that to happen you can't get crystal formation at a very like uh hot you know moving around boiling thing right you mm -hmm. need to let it cool down and then with the evaporation and uh you know the 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 water leaving then the molecules can kind of find each other and create these lattices and so i think what's happening is that the universe is cooling down and as the universe is cooling down it's reaching out to find a more stable energetic state and so it's linking up and i think that that's happening at all levels of complexity everything is linking up and like we're doing it too in our societies we're all linking up as well mm. you know and so as it gets colder and colder i think what you're you're going to have is you're going to have more and more um uh kind of creation of systems that can encode the information of the universe at cooler temperatures and i think that that's what we're doing right now by creating uh you know robotics, uh, electronics, all of that, because pretty soon, I mean, you know, not in our lifetime or our kids or anything like that, but, you know, in a, in a, in a universal time sense, uh, you know, these stars are going to start cooling down to the point where they won't be able to support life that's dependent on, on water. And so where does the information transfer happen? How do they connect? Well, it's going to connect through solar powered robotics, you know? Because the robotics aren't going to require uh, as much heat as living organisms require, you know. And we're already doing it, right? We're we're exploring the universe with the machines that we've built, the rovers that we have, all of that. You know, the human beings aren't going out and doing it. The machines are. And the machines are going to be able to hold more information as well. And I think the whole my my I've come to the realization that the meaning of life, at least that I can see it, is to create more information, to 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 entrap more information, to learn more. You know, it's like the universe trying to learn what it is. And uh, mm. there's a there's a really great book. It's called The Physics of Immortality uh, that talks about this. And you know that that you reach this kind of point uh, where the information becomes so vast that the universe uh, can basically create whatever you know crazy super computer that arises from this creation that we've that we're starting on that that will be able to create a simulation that will be uh no different than reality of itself because it, the computational power at that point will be so high that it can mm. create a lifelike simulation and then the whole question is is are we already in that simulation so yes there's a lot of that yeah. happening in physics right is is trying to understand that 
Um, well, thank you. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, because again, and we are, and uh, thanks for that book. Like as well, again, again, but I feel like a couple of books, you know, talk about these these kind of topics, right? Of like, okay, you know, there's entropy in the universe seems to be rising. So does that mean things become lifeless? Well, strangely, no. It seems things, yeah, like <laughs> information, almost the universe, like tries to understand and know itself. Um, well, it's kind of uh maybe not that related but it's a final topic and i didn't want to miss it because i'm really enjoying this um and we'll see if it links to the topics we talked about is you talk about like closed loop control of bioelectric um signatures i um well i want to ask what is that and then maybe we can talk a bit about that yeah so there's a paper um i i did in conjunction with a group uh at uc santa cruz and what they had is a is a uh, his name is Dr. Rolandi, and he basically made, uh, it's like a microelectrode array. So just think of it as a bunch of little like electrode pads, but very, very small in a grid, kind of like a checkerboard, right? And each one of the squares is an electrical pad. And you can control those electrical pads and you can send certain voltages through each one of those pads, right? Now, um, they use these microelectrode arrays a lot for neuronal stuff. So you grow your neurons on the electrical pads. And then when the neuron fires, the electrical pad can actually pick that up and you can see all the neurons firing. So you can actually see the activity of a neural network when it's sitting on these electrical pads. And then you can do kind of cool things where you like, you know, put out like a little electric shock on one of the pads and see how the whole network reacts. So Rolandi took this a step further and he put a, a film like this polymer over the electrical pad. And that polymer uh, had the, the, the capability of whenever the electrical pad underneath it activated, that polymer would release a potassium ion or it would release a chloride ion mm -hmm. on demand. And so what you could do is you could create a grid of ions. And so now you are uh, creating a spatial distribution of ions. And so what we had is we had cells that were uh, like directly across from that pad, like very, very, very close in contact with that pad. And so these cells, I had genetically modified them to um, have a biosensor in them. And the biosensor basically tells you what that voltage is of the cell. So um, if the, the voltage of the cell was uh, very hyperpolarized, the cell would become bright green. And if it was depolarized, the cell would dim down, right? It would be a, a dim green. And so what we would do is we would hit that electrical pad to release that potassium. And we would see if that cell would dim down, right? Mm. And then we would say, okay, we want that cell in that area to have this level of fluorescence to kind of keep it at this level of resting membrane potential, mm -hmm. but not all the others. The others, you know, will have their own resting membrane potential. Mm -hmm. So every time an image was taken after a stimulation, this machine learning algorithm would figure out, okay, how often do I need to hit this voltage, this little pad to make it so that this cell stays at this thing? And now remember, there's all these compensatory mechanisms, right? right. So you need that because it's not just straightforward, right? Like there is after a while, all the mm. cells like, hey, I'm going to start turning on the transcription of like more potassium channels, right? right. And so then that's going to change everything. So you need to have this on the fly control system that's constantly adjusting itself for what's going on with the cell. Uh -huh. And so we were able to keep, you know, a, a, a particular square of that pad at a, at a brighter uh, intensity than the rest of the, the pad. Uh huh. Oh, so so if I understand that correctly, like the interesting thing is that you could there's there's some way you can monitor and then have feedbacks to control the cell, and then you can couple that with machine learning so that you can like given compensatory mechanisms, you can keep it at a certain level. And, yeah. And, and, and maintain. And it's, okay, okay, interesting. And so spatial control of bioelectric signatures. And what was interesting with that was that we were working with stem cells. Mm -hmm. And so if the bioelectrics determine what the cells are going to become, 
Mm. then you could potentially grow your sell sheet up on something like this. And let's say, you know, you set the voltage for one line of that grid to be, you know, negative 30. And you set another line of that grid to be like negative 70. You know, then what you could create mm. is tissue that has like, let's say, liver right next to mm. muscle. Right. So that was, you know, that was the hope of that, uh, that initial paper was to extend that, but they okay. went in a different direction. And so I didn't get to do all the stuff that I wanted to do with that, but hopefully later on, uh, we can do it. I see. I mean, it's it maybe kind of spurs ideas already, but are there kinds of things that you, you, you're thinking about, like in the ways in which this could like help in, like regeneration or like help yeah, solve issues or things like yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, right now, the way that people reprogram stem cells is by using like very uh, complex mixtures of growth factors that they know will turn on transcriptional programs to particular things, right? So it's kind of like uh, they create a cell culture media that really looks a lot like liver if that's what you want to create. If you want to make cells that are liver cells, then you have to have media or, or you know, food for those cells that have most of the stuff that's in the liver, right? So like all the growth factors that you find in the liver. Uh -huh. um, however, growth factors are expensive, right? So what if instead of doing it that way, you take your stem cells and you put them in some media that just has the bioelectrics of the liver and it sets the bioelectrics of the liver. And so now will your stem cells turn into liver without the need of all the growth factors and everything else, right? Um, can you can you take them down that line uh, in a different way? Mm -hmm. And so um, some of the stuff that I'm working on uh, is to try to control the bioelectric state of the cells with optogenetics. And optogenetics is what they use in uh, neuronal science right now. And it's basically these light activated ion channels. And they use it to kind of shine lights in the brains of mice. And if they pulse it at a certain frequency, then it will create like these uh, different neuronal uh, activities that they can then look at and uh, they can say, okay, we want to activate this particular part of this neuronal network and we want to see what happens to the rest. Um, so that's how they use optogenetics. And so what I've been trying to do is use optogenetics in non-neuronal cells, which uh -huh. is, it's a beast of a problem <laughs> because in neuronal studies, they want optogenetics to be fast. They want fast on-off kinetics. Mm -hmm. So you shine the light, it opens for when you shine the light immediately. And then as soon as you turn off the light, it shuts off, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to modify resting membrane potentials, then you don't want it to shut off uh -huh. because light itself is toxic. The cells can't handle too much light. It depends on what the wavelength is of the light, but most optogenetic tools use blue wavelengths and blue is very high energy wavelengths right. of light. So it can fry your cells, basically. Mm. Um, so I want something that I can hit it with the light. And then that ion channel stays open for like 20 minutes. And then that can help sell, set its resting membrane potential, right? And then that way, I don't have to deal with a whole bunch of phototoxicity from it. So right. I basically went through all the papers for these uh, optogenetic channels. And I'm like, all right, where's all the garbage? Where's all the stuff that they started <laughs> with that it didn't work, you know? Oh, like I all see. the stuff that they used to kind of <laughs> like build on, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And that's what I wanted. I call these guys I'm like, hey, I want that channel. <laughs> it's the opposite of what they, they did. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah interesting um i mean one final thing is like are there any topics you wish you wish i had asked about or like that you wanted to discuss um that we didn't <laughs> uh yeah i mean we didn't talk too much about the regeneration aspect of things okay um yeah so like the regeneration thing is the whole reason why i i got into this game right okay. like was because regeneration was just so cool mm -hmm. um and so 
yeah, I don't, I don't directly work on the projects, but I definitely work, you know, with the people and give them ideas and, you know, stuff like that. We're all like, we all have lab meetings every week and we all like help each other with like ideas of like, you know, how maybe you can help this. But um, yeah, right now in the lab, uh, we have a, um, a, a biodome project, which is pretty cool. And uh, the biodome is like this kind of little cuff that has this silk gel in it. And in that silk gel, we can put different molecules that change the resting membrane potential. And also right now, I think they're putting in growth factors and things like that. And then um, right now, Devin in the lab is uh, cutting off like kind of the, the first uh, little part of the finger on mice uh -huh. and then putting this dome on it and seeing if we can get the uh -huh. regeneration. Um, and it's interesting because it seems like you don't have to have the dome on there for the entire time that it's regenerating. You only okay. have to have it on there for like the first 24 or 48 hours. And then all that that's all that's needed in order to jumpstart everything. And so this, this, was, uh, this is the mammalian equivalent of what we already did in frogs. And in frogs, uh, they were able to get partial regeneration of the limb uh, in an adult frog. So a frog mm -hmm. that normally doesn't regenerate. I see. Um, so that's pretty cool too. And, and uh, again, that's kind of what we keep seeing is that the bioelectrics aren't something that you have to have, like, you know, you don't have to go through uh, like, okay, we're going to set it to negative 70 now, and then we're going to set it to negative 50, you know, two days later, and then we're going to set it to negative 30 the next day. You don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. You can just set it to negative 70 for that first day, and then all the other genetic networks kind of take their cue from that, and they orchestrate the building of everything else afterwards. So that's really cool. That means that it's like kind of a, like a, uh, it's like if you're doing a movie and you know you need to set the stage right is it going to be a dark and stormy night like you know mm. it, it, like and then once yeah. that happens then the rest of the story kind of I evolves see. from that setting of the stage you know and i think that that's really uh that's that's really the power of the uh -huh. bioelectricity well, what is that that dome again uh, I, I was kind of confused. biodome Bio Bio yeah yeah how yeah. does that work yeah so, so yeah it's basically like a little cuff that goes over the amputated thing mm -hmm. and then uh you know it, it releases uh the the either the drugs that modulate the ion channels or uh -huh. growth factors that yeah. uh we think might help for the regeneration and then you take that dome off and then the the finger does its regeneration I see. Okay, awesome. Um, and yeah, on that topic, I mean, I, I should have brought it up before regeneration, but uh, like, um, is are there any, any other things that you wanted to mention on that? Like, like the so there's that way of doing. It. Are there any other things? Uh, yeah. I mean, the regeneration itself is really interesting, though, right? Because okay. you are like resetting the cell's identities uh -huh. to kind of baseline again. Right. And remember that experiment I told you about the tumor in the salamander's tail, right? Like mm -hmm. once you cut that salamander's tail where that tumor was, you were able to reprogram the cancer as well. So like what is the what is the communication that's happening in that regeneration area with something like cancer where it can reprogram it to now become normalized? Like that's interesting. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot more to explore in this crazy yeah. crazy world. Um, but yeah, it's it's very interesting. There's a lot of people that just think of bioelectricity as kind of like this, you know, secondary thing, and they don't really look at it as a control mechanism. Mm. Um, and you know, that's that's kind of madness to me, considering that you know bioelectricity is what what drives this organism to do what it does right like i mean without all the stuff that was going on bioelectrically in our brain like we would just kind of be sitting there so <laughs> yeah. i mean unless you're a paramecium <laughs> uh, um i guess to kind of like partly close this out then what are there any like scientists or papers or books that you'd recommend people interested in these kinds of topics 
Absolutely. Um, so Robert Becker's The Body Electric, that one is huge because mm. uh, that's the one that completely changed my life. Um, the other one is The Rainbow and the Worm by Mei Wan Ho. Uh, that's it, it's a book of the physics of life. And I think that's amazing. There's another one called uh, uh, Gels, Cells and the Engines of Life. And that one's great because it really talks about how our concept of the cell is kind of this idea of like kind of like this bag of fluid with all this stuff just kind of floating around in there. And that's not the case at all. It's like mm -hmm. it's more like jello and everything's organized. It's like a crystalline mm -hmm. lattice of organization. And uh, it really talks about like how things get shuttled. It's not just purely diffusion. It's actually like active transport up and down like these uh, these uh -huh. microtubules, which are the cytoskeleton of the of the cell. Uh -huh. So like there's like crazy shuttles that move things back and forth and that yeah. that shuttling itself. Um, and, you know, this is something if, if people are very interested in uh, is due to biophoton emission and biophotons are like these photons that travel through the middle of this of the mito of the uh, microtubules and the so the microtubules are hollow like rods right mm -hmm. and inside this will blow your mind and inside of those microtubules light is traveling and when the light bounces on the inside of that microtubule it changes the conformation of the protein that makes up the microtubule. Um, and that is what allows the little motors that are walking along the microtubule to move. Uh, and so uh, what provides the light? Well, the mitochondria are providing the light. The yeah. mitochondria actually release the reactive oxygen species that stimulate the production of the biophotons inside of those microtubules. Okay. So the mitochondria are actually strung along the microtubules because they're producing that light. And here's another one will blow your mind is that uh, DNA itself behaves a lot like those microtubules in that light is guided through the DNA structure, the double helix and DNA repair is dependent on light going through the DNA because if the light is going through the DNA and there's a problem, there's a mismatch or there's a gap in the DNA, then the light can't travel through correctly, right? So all along the DNA, there are these proteins strung along it, just like little pearls, right? And if that light doesn't hit the next pearl in the sequence then the pearl changes its conformation uh -huh. and that's how the repair complexes know where to go to fix the the thing so if your light is not being produced right so if your mitochondria are sick mm -hmm. then you're not repairing the dna as well as you should be because your light production is not as good as it should and guess what chromosomal abnormalities occur See. So your mitochondria are very, very key. There's like a, there's a there's a good book called Eating for Your Mitochondria, which is good because mm -hmm. people should know that, you know, you really need to be eating stuff that keeps those guys healthy and exercising because that also helps keep your mm -hmm. mitochondria healthy and happy. I see. Thank you. Yeah, it's fascinating that that there's like actual light like created within our own cells then that's um like necessary to because again i always found it strange like oh with optogenetics you can like start firing light into cells i'm like this it sounds seems like strange but when that's the case yeah um, so another really cool thing is i think uh it's a harvard no mit researcher that just figured this out so they hmm. saw that in people with alzheimer's there was a lack of these large uh, I, I believe they're gamma waves that are happening in the brain. And those waves are kind of like the waves that are necessary in order to kind of integrate like, you know, memories and, and things into the brain. And so um, they said, huh, I wonder if we use optogenetics to create these waves, if we can reverse the signs of Alzheimer's mm. in these mice that they had, right? So they started using optogenetics to do it. And then they had to do the control. 
And the control is not having the optogenetics, right? And just using the light. And they found that just using the light worked. And they were like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. So all they had to do was flash this light into the eyes of the mice. And that light itself would create the waves without the optogenetics at all. Uh -huh. And so they were able to reverse. So what happens is uh, these these light waves, when they happen, uh, the microglia, which are the immune cells of the brain, get activated. And they go and they start cleaning up all of the tau proteins that the Alzheimer's creates, which is, you know, all the tangles uh, that are in the in the brain. It starts cleaning them up. And so you can just shine light and the certain frequency and uh, it will start cleaning up the uh, damage from the Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. okay. So they're, they're going through clinical trials right now to, okay. to, to do this for, hum for humans. They, they already showed it that it works in mice, but they're going to do it in humans. So they, they shine light into the rat's eyes, you said? Yeah. So basically it's like this crazy strobe. Like you have to look at this strobe, like look into the light right. and your, your brain, your brain cleanup crew gets activated by that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one final thing um, it relates to, to talking about like uh, uh, symbiosis with the environment. I, I wonder often like the weird things that we haven't studied much, like, like you know radio and just different waves in our environment and like loud sounds like like maybe just <laughs> is any way to speculate on like the different things in our natural environments that we don't know what they do to us but we're like maybe something weird goes on <laughs> that oh yeah totally yeah electromagnetic radiation 100 percent. i mean so many of us don't realize that our cell phones are huge electromagnetic wave emitters mm -hmm. and their receivers right so uh, if you actually look at the uh, manual for your iPhone, it tells you that you shouldn't have this on your body directly, that it should always be like three inches off of your body. Uh -huh. And that's because of the electromagnetic radiation from the cell phones. And that's no, I mean, and now they're even stronger. Like it's called the mm -hmm. SAR rating of your phone. So the higher the SAR rating, the more electromagnetic radiation that it emits. And there was a, uh, a huge incidence of um, doctors, uh, surgeons that were on call uh, having uh, cancer kind of where they would keep their cell phones. Uh, mm -hmm. Because back in the day when cell phones first came out, like they were like these large clunky things that had a lot of radiation coming out of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they would get cancer around those areas. Also, women that would put their cell phones in their bras mm -hmm. would get breast cancer right in the area where the right. phone was. You could actually see exactly where it was. So, um, you know, there's things like uh, the cordless phones, uh, like, you know, when in your house, uh, cordless phones give off radiation that people can cause headaches in people can, uh, mm -hmm. he like set off epilepsy in, in certain people, um, and can also mess with your heart rhythm. You can actually get like a, a little fibrillation from it. Okay. Um, and then also Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi, uh, uh, router in your home. You shouldn't have that anywhere near your bed or where you're sleeping. You know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't, you shouldn't be very close to these things. You also mm -hmm. shouldn't, you also shouldn't sleep, uh, against a wall, have your head against a wall where there's like a large piece of electronics on the other side. So like mm -hmm. if there's a large, uh, big screen television or refrigerator, those also throw off huge magnetic fields. So there's, you know, there's a lot of things that we're not aware of with this new electromagnetic environment that we're building for ourselves that our, our bodies are actually tuned into very subtle fields. Like uh, we're, we're tuned in to the electromagnetic field of the earth and what happens, you know, in the seasons and everything else. I mean, that's why these animals can migrate as, as as directionally as they can so our cells are very tuned into this stuff and i'm sure you know the noisy electromagnetic environment that we've created for them screws them up i see interesting do you think that like even like like people have like uh what well, bluetooth wireless headphones and stuff and they put them oh yeah no way well i won't wear those things no I way see. yeah yeah no i i usually i i always have my phone on speaker um, I don't put it next to my head 
Because once Dude. you start to feel it getting warm on your ear, mm. like that's already way too long. I yeah. see. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- like that's this is this has been a really uh, great conversation. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Are there any like final words you want to say, or like people want to find your work, or or anything else that you want to? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, look up uh, Michael Levin's work. There's like such a broad range of things that we do in this lab that like something will I'm sure catch your interest um there's a lot of computational modeling stuff so if people do computational modeling or programming like this is something that you can get involved in like the Mm. biologists the biologists need the computational people because that's the one thing is once you start to look into systems and you start to look into these large scale things then you need more computational power to understand them and unfortunately because we're so specialized these days uh, most people People that have degrees in molecular biology or you know um, cell biology they're they're not programmers so we need to be mm. able to talk to one another like even talking to physicists you know having that same sort of talk mm. like reach out to different dif- different groups have conversations um, you know and and try to go out your comfort zone because you know like let's say I'm a biologist and I start reading a book on economics like maybe I can see some parallels between the two systems hmm. the, the two disciplines you know yeah i have a single economist on and partly it's because they contact them and they don't respond but but other people do <laughs> but also <laughs> they're too busy um but also because I, I realized like if you, you learn too much of a field you realize you actually learn more like you realize weirdly you know i realize cognitive science and biology somehow integrates the economics always <laughs> um, and Absolutely. i find i learn about economics from that um okay awesome um well thank you very much i uh, appreciate Thanks. it i'll stop recording Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.